All right. Uh, my name is James uh, from Varsity and Limited Tutors. Uh, I believe for some of you, we, we talked uh, a little yesterday. Then for some of you, you might be new here. Uh, this might be your first time uh, seeing me. Okay. So I am a private tutor who assists students uh, with their education. I do lessons, I assist students with their assignments, I assist students with exam preparation and et cetera. That's what I do. But however, for the next uh, two or so weeks, I'll be conducting some classes for free just to help you to introduce the module for those students that are interested, right? So for example, for economics, we'll be meeting every uh, Sunday. Uh, for finance, we'll be meeting every Thursday. Uh, that is for the guys that are doing advanced diploma. But I believe I've sent you guys the timetable uh, in the group. But also within your midest, uh, we also have got the guys that are doing our first year uh, who are going to be starting next week. I just sent them the link so that they can also join because they also do economics. Right? But I'm going to do another lecture with them, I think, uh, next weekend, uh, just them separately. But I just asked them to join through today so that they might also benefit from this class that we have since the module is the same. Okay. So what we want to do today is we want to look at an introduction to economics. And then once we are done, we are going to discuss a little bit more about how I usually work. Just like we did yesterday, I will start with the lecture. And then once the lecture is over, I will explain a little bit more about how you can get more assistance or more help uh, from me as a what? Uh, as a private uh, as a private tutor. Okay, so uh, let's go straight into economics. So I'm just going to go straight into economics. And then after the lecture, I will explain a little bit more. So stick up until the end where I will explain a little bit more. So today, what I just want to do here, I want to introduce you guys to the concept of what economics is all about. Okay, so when you're looking at the study of economics, right, economics is a very broad subject, which is made up of two specific areas. You've got macroeconomics and you've got microeconomics. Those are the two major areas of economics, right? So for this semester, we are going to be focusing on microeconomics. That's what we are going to be focusing on. But before we even go into that, let's look at what economics is, right? Because that's what we want to know. Before we even study it, what are we trying to study as what as individuals? So when we're looking at the study of economics, we are looking at the study of choices. Right. You and me, we have to make choices within our what? Within our uh, within our business setups. Right? We have to make choices. Now, these choices that we have to make, there is a reason why we have to make these choices. And when we study economics, we are studying the reason why we have to make choices and how we are going to make choices and the effects of the choices that we are going to make. Right. So when we make these choices, they're going to be effects and we are going to study it in what in economics. Now you might be asking me, what choices are you talking about? What effects, what are you, all, all of this information seems foreign to you as what, as a student, because maybe this is your first time hearing about what, uh, hearing about economics. Now, I want you to think, right, in an economy such as, such as the South African economy, right? If let's say that you are a business person, right? And you have got some capital with you. Let's say you've got 100,000 rand capital with you. You will have to make a choice, right? The reason why you have to make a choice in terms of what business should you get into is because you do not have 3 billion rand. You only have 100,000 rand, which means that there is a limitation to the amount of capital that you have as a business person. And because of that limitation, you cannot enter into any business that you want to. Because if I give you 3 billion rand, you might get into any business. But if I give you only a 100,000 rand, you only have got a limited number of choices that you can make in terms of the businesses that you can what? That you can get into, right? With what? With 100,000 rand. So we make choices in economics because of the limitations that that we have now whether you are a business person or whether you are a consumer or whether you are an agent for the government it doesn't matter all of us have to make choices the government of south africa has to make a choice whether to invest right in the freeway that is going to pumalanga or to invest in the freeway that is going to Cape Town. right it's a choice that they have to make because they've got a budget that they have at the beginning of the what at the beginning of the day right so 
any economic agent, whether it's a business, it's a government, it's an individual, it's a household, it's a consumer, whatever it is, it has to make a choice. And economics is about studying those choices. Like I said, studying the reason we make the choice, which is scarcity or which is limitation of the resources. Studying the way we make those choices which is where we talk about demand, where we talk about supply, where we talk about the theory of the firm, and studying the effects of those choices, where we are now talking about the issues of economic growth, the issues of opportunity cost, and etc. So that's what economics is all about. So the definition of economics is it is the study of the trade-offs and the choices that we make given the fact of scarcity. So these are three things there, right? Three things, trade-off, choices, and scarcity. Scarcity represents the limitations. Don't worry, we'll go into deeper into these things. Scarcity represents the limitations. Choices represent the options that you have. And whenever you make an option, whenever you have an option and you choose, there is something that you lose within your what? Uh, within your choice. There's something that you lose uh, within, your, uh, within your choice. So that's what... Uh, as uh, economics is all about the choices that we are trying to make as what as individuals within a what within an economy right so you can see the definitions there i'm sure you can read uh, by yourself but in summary that's what we are trying to what that's what we are trying to do right so if we want to get it more complicated now we are now talking about like i was saying issues of scarcity issues of resources issues of alternative uses issues of human behavior and etc but we'll go deeper into all of these different aspects but just wanted to highlight the definition of what of what economics is all about now when we are studying economics we divide our study of economics into two things right the first part of economics is what we call microeconomics. And the second part of economics is what we call macroeconomics. So those are the two types of economics uh, that we have to uh, that we have to study. Those are the two types of economics that we have to what to study at the end of the day, right? So when we are saying micro, that is M I. When we are saying micro, that is MIC, microeconomics, we are studying individual actions that result in individual consequences within an economy. What do I mean by that? I'm saying, for example, if there is one farmer, right, who has increased the price of their tomatoes, right, there is going to be a decline in the demand of the tomatoes of that one farmer. So that's microeconomics. We're looking at individual actions which result in individual consequences within a what? Within an economy, right? So that's what? That's microeconomics, right? Also, within the study of microeconomics, it might not be an individual per se, as in one farmer. It might be a group of farmers, but still, as long as they are making these decisions on an individual basis or on a, a, a streamlined basis, we are talking about farmers, right? We are not talking about the whole economy of South Africa. We are talking about farmers, or we are talking about the owners of grocery shops, or we are talking about the manufacture of agricultural products. Right? We are looking at one specific branch of things in economics. Then we call that microeconomics. The price of an individual item, the price of an individual item as you are selling it, right? the demand of an individual item, right? the success or a failure of a business right? or of a group of businesses. That's what we call microeconomics. But on the other hand, there is also what we call macroeconomics. Now, when we are looking at macroeconomics, we are now looking at broader things that affect the whole of the South African economy as a whole. Right. So, for example, if I'm now saying the price of all of the goods and services in South Africa, the price of everything is called the inflation rate. If you have ever heard the term, oh, the inflation rate of South Africa is currently at 4% or 6%, that's macroeconomics because inflation represents the price of everything. We are no longer looking at the price of tomatoes. We are no longer looking at the price of a cell phone, but we are looking at the price of everything within the South African economy. So that's what, that's macroeconomics. Or we are no longer looking at whether James is going to take the job or not, whether James is working or not, but we are looking at 
How many people in totality in South Africa are unemployed? If we say that there is 36 unemployment rate in South Africa, now we are talking about macroeconomics. Or when we're talking about the GDP, the gross domestic product of South Africa, the growth rate of the South African economy, the issues of the exports and imports, the trade balance of South Africa, or the issues of the budget deficit of South Africa. Now, that's what we call, that's what we call a uh, macroeconomics, i.e. a broad branch of everything combined in economics. So those are the two major branches of economics that we want, that we usually uh, talk about. But for this semester, uh, for this semester, we are going to focus mainly on the what? Uh, on the, um, we're going to focus mainly on the microeconomics, right? The individual decisions. Because you guys don't, we, go, we don't talk about macroeconomics before you understand how things work, right? Now, for you to understand how things work, right? For you to understand how things work, you are going to see that there are two things that you need to know about economics. There's what we call positive economics, and there's what we call normative economics. When something is called positive economics, it's factual in nature, right? It is a cause and effect relationship. We are saying that if I increase today the price, right, of the tomatoes that I'm selling from 10 rand per kg to 20 rand per kg, people are going to buy less tomatoes. That is a fact, right? So that's positive economics, right? So that's something that has been proven. Or if I say today, the unemployment rate in South Africa is 33.3%. That is positive economics because I have measured the unemployment rate. Or if I say the inflation rate in South Africa is currently 4.5%, that is positive economics. That is a fact. That is something that they've measured. That is something that has got a scientific backing to it. That is something that is objective, right? But on the other side of economics, which usually we find in macroeconomics, is what we call normative economics. Normative economics, these are judgments that you are making as an individual. It has nothing to do with facts. For example, if I say, uh, I think the South African government should increase our uh, minimum uh, wage rate to 50 rand per hour, because I think that will make sure that everyone is happy. That's my opinion. That's my opinion. That's not a fact. That's my opinion of the status quo of how things are happening. So that goes under normative economics. Or if I say, I think the South African border, the South African, sorry, the South African government should uh, not uh, participate in the BRICS, uh, BRICS uh, summit, right? That's again, an opinion that I have. It's not based on any facts. It's just an opinion that I'm having or a judgment or a policy recommendation or what I think ought to be in economics. So that's normative economics. Is it different from positive economics, right? So these are the key differences that you might need to know, right? I don't know if everyone is, are we on the same page on this one before I move on to the next one? Because we're not going to talk about this anymore the issue of the definition. Thank I'm you. now going to go into the terms. Yes, same page. All right. Yes. Sure. For on the same page, good. So now let's go a little bit deeper now into economics. So in in a, in a study guide, take note, there is an example. I would encourage you to go through this example. Please go through. It shows you the differences between micro and macroeconomics. I encourage you to go through. I've explained it properly, but I encourage you to go through this example in your study guide, which shows you that under macroeconomics, what exactly are you looking at? Under microeconomics, what exactly are you looking at? It will help you to visualize and understand what I am trying to explain. All right. So now let's get deeper into the, into the actual aspects of economics. I've given you the definition of what economics is, right? I've given you the broad aspects of the differences between macro and macroeconomics. But now I want you to understand economic terms. Because as we go through the semester, I'll be talking about wants, I'll be talking about needs, I'll be talking about demand, I'll be talking about supply, I'll be talking about scarcity, opportunity cost, and et cetera. So you need to understand what these things mean so that you understand what I am trying to explain at any point in time, right? So the first thing that we want to talk about is us as people, right? Each and every one of us, right? We are different uh, individuals, right? Uh, just give me a second here. Okay, all right, fine. 
each and every one of us, we are different individuals, right? You will find that what I want myself and what are any or Amleti or Claire or Cornelia wants, these are completely different things that we might want, that we might want as what as individuals, right? But the common thread is that the wants that we have are unlimited, right? When I say wants are unlimited, this is what I mean, right? I as James, you know what? I would love to have a house in Cape Town by the beach. I would also love to have a house in Port Elizabeth. I would love to have a house in Deben, in Peter Maritzburg, right? I would love to have 20 houses, 30 houses, 100 houses. I would love to own a Bugatti. I would love to own a Ferrari. These are my ones. And because these are ones that are not backed by anything, they are unlimited in nature. That's the way that we as people are made. We want things, right? I want nice clothes. I want nice houses. I want nice cars. I want all the nice things of life. So whenever in economics we talk about wants, we have to understand that wants are unlimited, right? The things that people want is unlimited in what? In nature. But however, we have to be able to differentiate between three things, which is where the confusion comes, right? There is something that we call wants, there is something that we call needs, and there is something that we call demand. Three things, wants, needs, and demand. If I say want, I'm talking about something where I'm unlimited. I want everything. But when I say need, a need is a necessity. It's something that I cannot live without. I need water. I need shelter, right? I need transportation, right? So a need by its very nature is the basic desire of something that you want, right? A want is unlimited, but a need is the basic, the necessity part of the ones that you have, right? You might want different types of houses, but you need shelter. Regardless of whichever house you eventually get, you need shelter, right, at the end of the day. Then thirdly, there's something that we call demand. If you have money and you want something, then that is demand, right? If I have one million rand in my account and I want, right, a legend 50, right, I can go and buy it because I want it and I have the money. So that's demand. So want that is backed by the ability to purchase, we then call it demand. So please make sure you understand the differences between these three things, wants, needs, and demand. Next thing, scarcity. Right? When we say scarcity in economics, we are talking about limitation. Right? So for example, I'll give you this example. Right? If you were a farmer, there is limited land in South Africa. You cannot just go and farm anywhere, everywhere because the land is owned by different types of people. So there is a limited amount of land in South Africa, right? There is a limited amount of resources. There is a limited amount of gold. There is a limited amount of forestry in South Africa. There is a limited amount of capital. There is a limited amount of labor that is in South Africa. So there is a limitation to the different types of resources that exist within an economy. And whenever there is a limitation to resources, we call that scarcity in economics. So whenever I say that something is scarce or that there is scarcity, we are referring to the limitation in terms of the resources. I would define what resources are, right? But we are talking about the limitation in terms of the resources, right? Now, if you combine unlimited ones and scarcity, People have to make a choice, right? We're saying that James wants a Bugatti, James wants a Ferrari, James wants a, a Porsche, right? But James has got scarce resources. James has only maybe 300,000 in the account, right? James has got what? He's got scarce resources. So James cannot have all of his wants. He has to make a choice. So if James with his 300,000, I know my example is not exactly good, but bear with me, right? If James makes a choice with the 300,000 that he has in his account and goes and buys a Ferrari, right? He, it means that he can no longer get the Bugatti, he can no longer get the Porsche. Right? So because of that, we are saying that there is a cost attached to the choices that we make as what? As individuals. And that cost is the loss of the thing that you would have obtained. And that is called opportunity cost. In short, the definition of opportunity cost is the value of the next best alternative that you had to forego when you made a choice. 
right? In economics, we say that there is no free lunch. What do we mean by that? We are saying that, for example, if someone tells you, oh, I want to take you out for lunch, right? You can come at three o'clock, we can go and eat some food. Yes, you got some food and you did not pay money for it, but you paid for that food in terms of time. That one hour that you were eating the food from three to four o'clock, you could have probably done some laundry, you could have visited your uncle, you could have started a business, you could have sold some items if you're in insurance or whatever. So there is no concept of a free lunch or there's no concept of a free product. In essence, whatever choice that you make, there is always an opportunity cost or there is always the next best alternative that you have to forego in the choices that you, that you make, right? In the choices that you make. Then lastly, right, on this slide, Poverty and scarcity are two completely different things. Do not mix those things up together, right? Poverty is faced by people that do not have money, right? Scarcity is faced by everyone. Elon Musk faces scarcity, right? But Elon Musk is not poor. He does not face poverty, right? What am I trying to say? Scarcity is the limitation of the resources on a national level. We are not talking about just your resources only, but on a national level. As much money as Elon Musk might have, right? But he still does not have enough in terms of what he wants. He wants to do all of these different things, but he does not have the resources. He does not have the labor that he needs. He does not have the capital that he may need. He might not have even the skills that he needs. So scarcity is never going to be solved. There is always going to be scarcity. Whereas poverty is a different story, right? Poverty is a different We'll talk about issues of poverty and whatnot when we do macroeconomics. But under microeconomics, we are looking at scarcity, the limitation of the resources of an economy, right? Okay, so now I want to talk about, uh, well, let me jump this a little bit. Let me come to this. I want to talk about resources, right? So that we can finish up on uh, this slide because resources are very, very important for you to understand what we say when we talk about resources. So in economics, right? Whenever we are talking about resources, right? Whenever we are talking about resources, we are talking about four key resources. Whenever we use the word resources in economics, we are talking about four things. Whenever we say that there is scarcity of resources, we are talking about limitation of these four things, right? These are the four things that we are talking about. Land, capital, labor, and entrepreneurial schemes. In economics, when we say land, we mean natural resources. Anything that is a natural resource, we refer to it as land in economics. The actual land where you farm, right? That's land, right? The trees that grow on the land, it's still part of land. The water, the oceans, the wind, the solar energy, it's also part of land. The kudus, the livestock, the whatnot is also part of the land. And we refer land as a primary factor of production, i.e. when you want to produce something, you primarily need to have land or you primarily need to have natural resources. So these resources are also referred to as factors of production, i.e. they are used within the production process of what we are doing. So like we said, just think about it, land is limited. That's why there are borders. That's why land is limited, because there are borders. You cannot go into Botswana right now and start just farming in Botswana without their authority. You know, they will arrest you because it's not your land, right? So land is limited in nature, right? Natural resources are limited. That's why we are crying about deforestation and whatnot, climate change and all of those things, because land is limited in nature. It is scarce, right? Second resource, we can talk about labor. Again, labor is called a primary factor of production. You see these things that I'm putting in yellow there, it's very important for your exam or for your assignments. Right? You need to understand the differences. So land, uh, labor is also a primary factor of production. I, you cannot produce without land. You cannot produce without labor. These are primary factors of production. Right? So these primary factors of production, they are not man-made. They are naturally available. Right? So labor, labor can be two things. Labor can be physical labor, i.e. you need people to actually show up. Maybe you're into farming or you're into construction or something like that. You need people to actually show up. Or labor can be intellectual. You need the mind. You don't need the person to show up, but you need their ideas. You need their ability to think, right? So that's intellectual labor. 
right? So labor is also sometimes referred to as human capital. That's another resource that you need. And again, it's limited. There are only 65 to 75 million South Africans currently existing. Right. So you cannot have an economy that needs you see you see those countries like Canada, um, uh, the 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 United States that uh, do these immigration policies where you can come there and work there. The reason why they are doing that is because they are saying that there is limitations or shortages of labor. So they are taking people that are not their citizens to come and work within their countries because of scarcity of labor. So labor is scarce within an economy, right? Uh, third one is what we call economic capital. Now, this one is confusing to many students because there's what is called financial capital in this something that is called economic capital. In economics, when we are talking about resources, we are referring to economic capital. We are not referring to financial capital. Although financial capital is useful in the procurement of economic capital, but whenever you see a question, that says name the four factors of production and there is either money or financial capital that is wrong. It's not part of the resources. The resources, it's economic capital. So what is economic capital? Economic capital is anything that is man-made that is used in the production process. So for example, me as, 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 as James and the VUT company, when we do tutoring, we make use of laptops. Right? That's a economic capital. That's a man-made resource that we are using in the production of a lecture, right? So that's economic capital, right? So if you are at Coca-Cola and you're producing soft drinks and you've got a factory, right? And in your factory, you've got some plant and equipment, that's economic capital for what are uh, for Coca-Cola. If you're in the delivery vehicle, delivery business, right? You take a lot and whatnot, and you've got vehicles that deliver products to your customers. That's economic capital. That's what we are talking about. Money in the bank is not economic capital. That's financial capital. That's not part of the manufacturing, uh, of the uh, factors of production, right? Then lastly, you've got entrepreneurial ability. Entrepreneurial ability is the entrepreneur who comes in and combines the land and combines the capital and combines the labor into a specific business that then produces the different goods and services that are produced in the economy. It is the individual who is willing to take the risk of success or of failure in the production process. That's entrepreneurial ability. And we need that because if we do not have entrepreneurs, you will notice that our economy will suffer. So that is why you see governments are always, yeah, we want to train new entrepreneurs, small and medium enterprises. This is where it's coming from because they know that entrepreneurial ability is an important uh, resource in the what in the month in the uh, factors of production. So two primary factors of production, land and labor, two secondary factors of production, capital and entrepreneurship. Now. I hope now you can actually understand better when we are talking about unlimited ones, scarce resources, opportunity cost. You are now understanding. Because what we're going to do next is we're going to talk about the economic problem. But before I go there and speak about the economic problem, anything that I've said so far, is there anything that did not make sense? Is there anything that you need me to explain further before I go to my next, uh, my next slide? Okay. Uh, sorry, sir. Can I just ask you something? Yes, go ahead. Okay, on the four factors of production, so you said land and labor are primary. So is the economic capital and entrepreneurship secondary? Yes, correct. They are secondary okay. factors of production. Economic capital and entrepreneurship are secondary factors of production. Yes. Any other questions? Anything that I said that you did not understand that you need me to, to, to go over again? Can I ask a question? Sorry, sir. Yes, go ahead. So it's not something that you've necessarily um, presented here, mm -hmm. but in class today, um, the lecturer mentioned technology as part of um, sources of Can production. Can you explain in detail? So I'm Could just wondering. Opportunity if... cost. I'll come back to you. Let, let the other lady finish. Okay, go ahead. You were saying? Thank you. So I'm just wondering if... Um, Am I mixing um, factors of production with sources of production? Um, I just wanted clarity on those two. Okay. So under economic capital, right? 
Remember, I said that anything that is man-made that is used in the production process is referred as what? As economic capital, right? So when we are looking at issues such as technology, right? There were there is some way we're going to discuss a little bit more about technology. But just to answer your question, when we are looking at issues of technology, right? The technology that we use comes into our economic capital most of the time. It comes into what? Into our economic capital. Because like, remember, I was talking about uh, my, my laptop that I use in my production process. Because remember, I'm a business and I am producing a service, which is the economics lecture that I'm producing right now. And I need land. I need natural resources, right? I need a space where I can work, right? Where I've rented and I'm working from there. I need labor, someone to present, which is me presenting here. I need an entrepreneur, someone to come up with the, the ideas and whatnot. That's my boss. That's what he does. He's the entrepreneur. But I also need economic capital. Economic capital includes my laptop. The technology of Zoom that we are using to connect right now. The technology of Vodacom that is connecting us through the internet and whatnot. So technology comes and fits into economic capital. But there is a space where we are going to discuss more about issues of technology. But it fits into the economic capital because it is a man-made resource that we are using in the production uh, process. Right. Then uh, to answer the person who was talking about uh, opportunity cost, right? So let's go back to that slide for opportunity cost. Uh, where is it? Okay. So if you want to think about opportunity cost, think about it this way, right? Let's say, uh, this is a bad example, but let's use it. Let's say that you have got 100 rand, right? You've got 100 rand with you. Because economic cost, there are two ways of calculate, of doing economic cost. But I want to start with the first one. Let's say that you've got 100 rand and you want to make a decision. With 100 rand, you can go and buy Roman's pizza, right? With 100 rand, you can go to Steak Neko and watch a movie, right? At the, at the cinemas, right? With 100 rand, you can buy uh, a gin. But guess what the gin costs? The gin costs maybe 60 rand, right? That's the price. I know, bad example. Gin, the, the, the gin clothes, it costs 60 rand. But the ticket to Steak Neko, it costs 100 rand. And the Roman's pizza costs 100 rand. And then you make a choice. And you say, you know what? I'm going to the movies. And I'm going to see myself a movie and you go to the movies. You have made a choice. And because you've made a choice, you're forgotten. You can no longer eat the pizza. You can no longer buy the gin. So when we're saying opportunity cost, the value of the next best alternative for God, what are the alternatives for God? You have forgotten the Roman pizza. You have forgotten the gin, right? The, the clothes, right? But which one was the best alternative? The the, 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 the pizza was costing 100 rand, whereas the gin was costing 60 rand. So according to value, you are saying that the what? The, 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 the pizza was actually better than the gin because the pizza, you are, you are equating issues of quality. We are saying that because it was more expensive, we are going to say it was a better choice than the what? Than the gin. So the value of the next best alternative for gone. You are saying your opportunity cost is going to be the pizza that you did not eat. It's not the pizza plus the gin, no. It's just the first item. That is on top. So it's going to be the pizza. That's your opportunity cost there. But in economics now, it gets even more complicated, right? It gets even more complicated. Sometimes the question will come and ask you what is the opportunity cost? And you can easily say the opportunity cost was the gym. The opportunity cost was the pizza. The opportunity cost was the car. The opportunity cost was the house. But sometimes it wants the actual value. It wants the answer in rands, the answer in dollars. Because remember, it says the opportunity cost is the value of the next best alternative for God. Right. So I'll give you a different example. Now, this can be very confusing, but I'll give you a different example. So let's say again, you have got a choice, right? You have got 2,000 rand, right? You have got 2,000 rand. And with your 2,000 rand, you can take the 2,000 rand and you can go on a safari trip. Option number one. Option number two, with the 2,000 rand, you can what? You can buy yourself a cell phone. The safari trip costs uh, 2,000 rand. The cell phone, let's say that the cell phone costs uh, 1,500 rand, right? Again, with the 2,000 rand, you can buy yourself, let's say, uh, maybe you can buy yourself some, uh, some clothes, and after buying the clothes, let's say the clothes are costing 1,000 rand, you can also go to the cinema, another 1,000 rand. 
Those are different options there. You can either buy clothes or you can go to the cinema for 1,000 rand. And if someone wants to ask you what is the opportunity cost, you are likely to say, ah, I think the 1.5, the cell phone is better because its, it's price is higher than the other ones. But that's wrong. Why? Because you are, remember, you are you have chosen to go to the safari for 2,000 rand. So it should equate to that 2,000 rand. So you are going to say the opportunity cost is going to, you are going to add up the things that add up to 2,000 rand, which means it's actually going to be both the clothes that you could have bought and the movie that you could have gone and combined all of that is going to give you 2,000 rand. That's why I say it can get actually very confusing at the end of the day. But we will do some examples. I've got some past exam papers. We'll do some examples together and I'll explain further into detail about how to calculate economic costs and all of those things. But in short, what you need to know is opportunity cost is the value of the next best alternative for gold. So the first question you ask yourself is what is the best alternative that we have forgone as an individual? That's the first question that you ask yourself. If it's an issue of calculations, don't worry. I will show you how to do the calculations. If it's an issue about calculating, we'll do a number of examples together. I hope you answered. Okay. Let's see. Is there another question before I go to my next slide? If there's no question, I'll go to my next slide. Again, remember, I'm still just introducing what economics is. We, have, we haven't even started. We're just introducing the different terms so that when we start talking, you understand me as we go by and by, right? So in economics, we are sorry going to... to... Yes? Sorry to disturb you, sir. Mm -hmm. I just, just want to find out, on the opportunity cost, mm -hmm. is it not the best option that you have to work on when you had other options, the one that's hurt you the most out of all, out of the three, maybe let's say you had three options. Mm -hmm. The one that cost you the most, is is it not that the opportunity cost? Opportunity cost, listen to the definition, the value of the next best alternative for God. If you follow that definition, you'll find it's very, very straightforward. Because there are two cases. I don't want to, 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 to get into calculations because I know calculations can be something else. There are two cases in economics. You can be given a question where you are given things. The person could choose a cell phone. The person could choose a computer. The person could choose this. That's a straightforward question. Complicated questions will not have the product. They will have the value. They will talk about runs, actual runs, and it gets even more complicated. So if you don't follow the definition, you have problems when you get to the calculations. But in short, if you're making a choice, the next thing that you would have chosen, the next thing that you would have chosen, if you, are, if you have got a car, a bus, or an aeroplane, and you choose an aeroplane, and you, you, and you are saying that if I had to choose again, I think I'll take the bus, then the bus is the opportunity cost. So the next thing in the list of choices Order your choices in an order. Make an order of your choices. I would prefer this. Then after this, I prefer this. And after this, I prefer this. The next thing after you make your choice is the one that is the opportunity cost. The next best alternative that has been foregone when you made the choice. All right. So in economics, we are going to talk about goods and services. right? But you will notice the language of economics. He's always going to come back and say, uh, the, 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 the company, the goods provided, the goods in an economy, the economic goods and whatnot. Whenever we use the word economic goods or whenever we use the word goods, produce production of goods in a, in, a, in, a, in a company, we refer to both goods and services, right? We refer to both goods and services. The word economic goods does not exclude services. Please take note of that. The word economic good does not exclude, it includes actual physical goods and services that can be produced by what by a specific company right? in economics when something is an economic good it means that you have to pay to obtain it it also means that it has been produced by scarce resources i.e there is a limited or a limitation in the production of that specific thing when something is called a free good in economics it means that you don't have to pay to obtain it, number one. Then number two, the resources for the production of that good are abundant, right? That's why you don't have to pay it. So for example, oxygen can be referred to as a free good. I know you can start to go to hospitals and start getting charged, yes. But oxygen can be referred to as a free good. Why? Because you can freely consume it without what? Without paying for it. And it is not scarce. You just go outside, you can breathe, 
right? It's, 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 that's a free good, right, in economics. So a free good, it has two conditions. Number one, you don't have to pay for it. Number two, it has to be abandoned, i.e. there's no scarcity. Then there's something that we call a public good. A public good, you might not pay for it directly, but because it is a scarce resource, you might pay for it indirectly. So, for example, the lighting on the national streets, on the freeway, right, the street lights on the freeway, you don't go to, to, to ESCO and pay the electricity bill for the freeway yourself, right, you enjoy it. So, it's a, you are saying, I don't have to pay for it, but the taxes that you pay, your income tax, the VAT that you pay when you buy your product, it is used to facilitate for that. Same thing, the national defense uh, forces, the South African police, Home affairs services, you don't necessarily have to pay for some of those things, but through your taxes, through your VAT, you are contributing towards the production of these things because they're actually limited in nature. All right. Then there are things that we might call consumer good. Now, these ones, you might not talk about it this semester a lot, so I'll just go to browse to it. Consumer goods, you are talking about goods that are used for consumption, i.e. if I go to spa, and buy bread, that's consumer good. If I go to um, to a shop and buy a television, that's a consumer good. But when I'm talking about a capital good, I'm talking about a good that is used in the production process. For example, if I buy a laptop to use at the company, that's a capital good. Or if I buy a, 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 a car to use in delivery, that's a capital good. So a consumer good is for current consumption, a capital good is used in the production. Uh, our process is used in the in the production uh, process. Then resources, we talked about resources. Intermediate goods, and this is just something that has not yet been finished. Right? So, so for example, if you buy wheat, wheat is an intermediate good. You don't buy wheat for the sake of eating wheat. You buy wheat, you make it into flour, and you make it into bread. Bread is the final product. It's the final or finished good. But wheat is an intermediate good. I, you just don't buy it for the sake of food, but you buy it so that you can use it in production and then it can become the what? The final product in the what? At the end of the day, right? So that's uh, some, 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 some extra definitions there. So let's see, I've covered that, I've covered that, I've covered that. Okay, now let's talk about the year. Now we're in the context. Now we are starting to talk about economics now. So, like I said, everything that we've done so far, it was just to conscientize you in terms of what we want to learn. But now we are now looking into what economics is, what is all about. So why do we study economics, right? Why do we study economics? We study economics to solve what is called the basic economic problem. The problem that is faced by every country in the world. The problem that is faced by every community and every society. And what is that problem? This problem is whereby there are limited resources or there are scarce resources and there is unlimited ones. So the economic problem is the mismatch or a misalignment between unlimited ones and limited resources in the economy. Again, I'll repeat. James wants a Ferrari. James wants a Bugatti. James wants, you know, all of the different cars that are out there. But James has got limited resources, and that is the problem. How do we solve? What do we produce? How do we produce? Who do we give the products to? That's the question that we ask ourselves now in economics. That's what the whole study of economics is all about. You will notice that chapter after chapter after chapter, we will be trying to answer these three questions, right? Because people want everything. But also because we only have got a limited amount of labor, we have a limited amount of land, we've got a limited amount of capital, we've got a limited amount of entrepreneurs. So what should we produce as an economy in South Africa? Right. Should we go into the production of gold or should we go into the production of platinum? Should we produce clothes or should we produce food? Should we produce cars or should we produce computers? That's what the government is asking. That's what the business people are asking. Which, what should I produce? What should I get into business for? What can I make money from? So that's the question of what to produce in economics, right? What to produce? What type of products should we be producing? What type of services should we be making available as what is in economy? Should we focus on just food? As a South African economy, we're not going to do anything else. We're just going to do, uh, you know, mangoes, uh, oranges, wheat, you know, uh, uh, you know, everything that is going to do with food. That's what we're going to do. 
or we go into the production of capital goods. So if you look on the world economy, if you have ever looked at economics at large, you notice that if you go into China, you notice, oh, Chinese come, China is, is known for manufacturing, right? That's what they decided. They decided, no, you know what? In our economy, we are going to be manufacturers. We are going to be producing products. That's what we are going to do. If you go into a different country, right? You are going to go to the, uh, to the United States. You're going to know they are known for technology. Right. They are coming up with all of these different technologies and whatnot, computers and whatnot. That's what they decided to focus on, right? If you go into issue countries like Germany, you know them for cars, right? So it depends with what the country has chosen. If you go into some African countries, they are known, you know, for production of agricultural products. That's what they chose when they were answering the question, what to produce. So every economy, every business person, every individual asks that question. What should I produce? That's an economic question there. What should I produce? The second economic question is how to produce. Now that I have decided that we want to produce agricultural products in South Africa, we want to produce mangoes and oranges and wheat, that's what we have decided. How do we produce it? Do we make use of combined harvesters or tractors and whatnot? Are we going to be capital intensive in our production process? Or we are going to make use of people. We want people with some holes to go into the farm and start digging. That we are going to be labor intensive. Or do we go to Dubai, for example? They have shortage of land. Guess what they are doing? They are going through the sea and they are putting sand there to create land. Go into Israel. Right. They've got shortages of land. What are they doing there? They are doing what is called vertical agriculture. Right. So how do we produce? Right. What are we going to how are we going to combine? How are we going to combine labor, capital, entrepreneurial skills? So the question of how to produce is the question of the combination of the factors of production, right? which brings to the question that the other lady was talking about, which is technology which other authors say technology is the fifth factor of production because they do not want to put it under what? They do not want to put it under the, 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 the issues of capital, the issues of uh, capital. They then put it maybe as a separate factor. But honestly speaking, if you check most test books, it's put under, 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 under economic capital. But you can, you can put it as a fifth factor of production if you want. But again, you're asking yourselves, how do I combine these things? How much of land is going to be needed? How much of capital is going to be needed? How much of technology is going to be needed in my production process as a company, right? Or as an individual or as an economy? So whenever you're talking about combining factors of production, you are answering the question, how to produce, right? we we'll go to the next one, for whom to produce? right, for whom to produce. Now that you have decided that you want to produce agricultural products, right, you have decided, oh, we are going to be labor intensive, we're going to use people in our agriculture. That's what we're going to do. Now that you've got some tomatoes and some potatoes that are on the farm, how are you going to distribute them? Are you going to have a farmer's market where people come and pay for the product? Or the government is just going to take and distribute, make a line, let's share this thing, let's reshare the product. And whatnot. So the issue of how do we distribute the products? How do we make price for the products? How do we ensure that people get our products? That's the question of for whom to produce. So in economics, there is what we call the basic economic problem, and there's what we call the three economic questions that need to be answered. The basic economic problem is about scarcity and budgetary constraints. It's about the mismatch between unlimited wants and limited resources. And the three economic questions try to solve the basic economic questions by asking the economic agent or the government or the company, what should they produce? How should they produce what they've decided to produce? And whom should they give the products that they have produced? So that's what economics is going to be all about. So I'm only left with one thing that I want to talk about today. But before I go into that one thing, is there a question on the issue of the economic problem that I just talked about? Is there a question there on economic problem? Okay. 
there's no question, which means it was very, very clear. I love that. Okay. So, so James, yes. Uh, just, I just needed some clarity, man, on mm -hmm. um, how I identify if something is a secondary or a, or a primary without claiming it, just to get a clear understanding of that. Uh, Sorry to take you. Primary factors of production uh, naturally exist. They just naturally exist. Secondary factors of production are basically like the amendment. In, it's not a, it's not a okay. correct way to say it, but to help you, in terms of just to help you. So labor naturally exists. A person is born, they are now part of the labor force. Whether mm -hmm. they like it or not. Right? Land naturally exists. Right? Then when you're going into things that are man-made, you're now going into capital. Right? Entrepreneurial skills, that's not something that you're born with. That's something that you have to be trained on. So oh, okay. An entrepreneur, you have to be trained in the art of entrepreneurship. So it's man-made, something that is, it's labor that has been trained into entrepreneurship and risk-taking and whatnot. All right. I hope you answered that. Thank you. Clear. Sure. So some extra notes now. On the, I'm still on the economic problem, but I want to open up your mind. I want you to see what we are talking about, right? So remember, I said that the economic problem is faced by different economies across the world, right? So these different economies that face the economic problem across the world, uh, just give me a second here. These economies that face the economic problem around the world, right? They have tried to solve the economic problem, right? And the way that they've tried to solve the economic problem is by creating different types of economics. They will solve the economic problem by creating different types of what? Of, uh, of economics. These different types of economics that they've created, economies that, uh, that they've created, right? There are four economics that you need to know as a student. One of it is no longer important because it no longer exists, right? But, you know, for the sake of learning, we'll, we'll just chat a little bit about it. So there's what we call the traditional economy. There's what we call the command economy. There's what we call the market economy. And there's what we call the mixed economy. So these economies are trying to solve the economic problem, right? They are trying to answer the economic questions of what to produce, how to produce, and for whom to distribute, right? So what am I saying when I'm saying an economy? An economy, I'm saying it's a system of how things work. That's what I say when I'm saying an economy. It's a system of how things work. Now, let me start with the command economy. Right? A command economy, we call it a centralized economy. Right? So although it's very rare these days to find a good command economy as an example, but if you look into com uh, countries such as uh, Cuba, I think uh, North Korea is to command, Cuba is, is command, North Korea is command, uh, China is no longer really command. But you know, some people will make use of China also as an example. Uh, China, uh, which other one is command? Um, all right, let's, let's use those three examples. Right? So a command economy is a centralized economy. Centralized economy is saying that decision making within that economy is centralized. Right? We are saying that there is a group of people that make decisions of this year, we are going to produce 1,000 tons of wheat. We are going to produce 100 vehicles. We are going to produce 1,000 computers. There are people that make those decisions on a central basis, and then they are implemented within the economy. That's a command economy. So that's how they answer the question of what to produce. It is the what? It is the what? It is the central authority of the economy that answers that question. The question of how to produce, the same central authority answers that question, but usually through people that they've put in as captains of industry, who then sit down and then come up with a production plan, which is authorized by the central authority. Then the question of how to distribute or for whom to produce, they usually do what is called rationing, which means you can't buy something. They ration the thing to you. They are saying that you this year, we're going to give you 50 kgs of flour, 20 kgs of sugar. We're going to give you this. They are rationing what you can, what, what you can consume within that, what, within that economy. So that's the command economy, right? The other example is what we call the market economy. Now, an example, again, there's, it's very difficult to get an example of a market economy, but the best economy that I can give you for market economy is, uh, is the US, the USA. 
right? And maybe uh, the UK and a couple of other countries in, the, in, 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 in Western Europe, they can fall under the market economy. In the market economy, we are saying that there is no central authority, although that's why I'm saying it's difficult because most countries have got governments, right? But it's now the level of involvement of the government. Right? So in a market economy, there is no central authority, right? It is the people within the economy that decide, right? So if you go to the US, there's no one who's going to say that uh, this year we want to produce this, this year you're supposed to, uh, to pay people this amount of money. The businesses decide to hire or to fire you. The business decides what they want to produce. As long as they're following the laws of the country, they decide what they want to produce at the end of the day. So in a market economy, there's what we call self-interest. Self-interest, we're saying that because as a business, you want to make profit. You only produce things that are profitable. As an individual, because you want to maximize utility, you're only going to buy things that maximize your utility. So if you are happy as a consumer, the business will produce the goods that you're happy with. So that is called the free market forces or the invisible hand of the economy, right? Where things just match up because of self-interest within the what? Within the economy. So self-interest answers the questions of what to produce, how to produce, and for whom to distribute. You're going to see that there'll be prices. If the price is too high, people don't buy because of self-interest. If the price is too low, people will buy a lot because of self-interest. So it will self-correct or self-regulate through the invisible hand of the what? Of the economy or through the free market forces, right? Then there is the third one, which is the mixed economy. The mixed economy now, it combines all of these different things different economies. It combines all of these different economies that you want, that you see. So in the mixed economy, you are going to find some central authority might exist, which might make some decisions for the economy. So for example, if you go into South Africa, you might find that the government might make some decisions in terms of agriculture, right? That you cannot price your products in agriculture above this price. Or in terms of labor, they might put a minimum wage rate. You cannot pay an employee below this specific amount of money. So that's a mixed economy where you've got the involvement of a central authority in answering those three questions. But you also have got the free market forces and self-interest driving the economy. Then the last one is the traditional economy. This one I didn't want to talk about. Like I said, it no longer exists. This was what was there before we started really talking about economics, where there was the issues of religion and culture, which were influencing how things were produced within a what? Uh, within, uh, within a specific what? Within a specific uh, economy, right? So guys, I'm going to give you, uh, let's say, two minutes to just think of the questions. We are done with the lecture for today. I'm going to give you two minutes to just think of the questions that you want to ask me, and then I'm going to give you guys an opportunity to ask some questions. And then I'll talk about how the lectures will proceed from today. So just two minutes, just give me two minutes, think about the questions that you want to ask, and then I'll highlight you can ask me the questions. Just give me two minutes, and then I'll highlight you can ask questions. I just need to do something. Okay, guys, I'm back. Uh, let's have your questions. Um, James, I just have a question. Um, yes. Sorry, I just logged in a little bit um, after mm -hmm. you started. Mm -hmm. But as far as the definitions are concerned, mm -hmm. I see your def you've got a Mancosa definition. Mm -hmm. And also, when it came to opportunity, of course, there were some underlinings and mm -hmm. stuff. Mm -hmm. I just want to understand mm -hmm. if what you have mm -hmm. is what 
one must actually religiously go by mm -hmm. or one can actually um, paraphrase um, based on their own understanding. Um, what advice would you give as far as that is concerned? I think it's, I've just realized, yeah, this man calls a definition and also an opportunity cost you had some underlining. So I wasn't sure whether we're supposed to follow yours or the 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 book that we have or our own paraphrasing. No, you you have to understand. You have to understand. Because uh, there's something that uh, that's part of what I also wanted to discuss at the end. So what you notice is that uh, your exam, if you have seen your past exam papers, most of the times it might come through as multiple choice. Right? So multiple choice is not about claiming. It's about understanding. Right. It's about because if you claim something, you're going to fail. I don't have to lie to you. Multiple choice is very tricky. Economics, the questions for economics, multiple choice, it will be the same answer, just written differently. So you actually have to understand the definition itself. It's not about claiming, it's about understanding. So it's not about knowing which is the Mancosa definition or which definition James used, but it's actually understanding what that definition actually means. So whenever you're talking about economics, it's understanding that ah, economics is about the economic problem. Economics is about the study of the choices that people make. And why do people make these choices? Because they have unlimited wants and the resources are limited. That's it. That's what economics is. The actual wedding and whatnot doesn't matter as long as you understand the concept of what you're trying to do. Same thing with opportunity cost. It's about understanding that when you're talking about opportunity cost, we're saying that someone made a choice. And when they made a choice they, to sacrifice something, what is it that they sacrificed? That's the opportunity cost. Right. So that's that's what it is. It's not really about claiming, but it's about understanding the content. That's why you see at every regular intervals, I ask, did we understand each other? Because I do not want you to go and say, I'll claim the notes. Because if you claim the notes, I don't want to lie to you. You're not going to make it. You have to understand what we're talking about. All right. Another question? James. Yes. Um, when you were defining micro and macro economics uh -huh. um i i understood that uh, micro is more individual yeah. so going into market economics mm -hmm. where would you classify it would you classify it as micro or macro because there it's people micro. are deciding for themselves under market uh, economics yes it's micro it's, it's micro. micro. Yeah. Because what you need, okay. right, is okay. when you are when it's macro, it's everything. Whenever we talk about macro, it's everything. It's the whole economy. For you to understand macroeconomics, think of what they are, what we call the macroeconomic objectives. The macroeconomic objectives is how do we grow our economy? How do we reduce unemployment? How do we solve inflation? How do we solve issues of trade balances? Those type of questions, that's now macro. Right. But whenever we are talking about decisions, this business gets into the market, what happens to the whole market? This person makes a decision like this, what happens to the households? Do people increase their consumption or decrease their consumption when the price rises? What happens to the people of this particular neighborhood? We are still talking about people. We are still talking about individuals. As long as we are still talking about individuals, we might talk about a group of individuals, but as long as we are still talking about the individuals, it is microeconomics. As long as we are still talking about the businesses themselves, it's microeconomics. But the moment we now talk about the total production of the South African economy, I've not mentioned the business anywhere there. Now we are going into macroeconomics. Next question. Uh, I'm sorry, sir. Can I come in? Yes, go ahead. Uh, I missed uh, in the beginning, the audio was just not clear. You mm -hmm. said you presenting uh, finance when? Uh, on Thursday. We did yesterday. What I guess time? we are doing another one on Thursday. What time? At 7 o'clock, 7 p.m. in the evening. Thank you, sir. All right. Another question? Uh, mm hmm Will you share um, your work, uh, James? Uh, the, the okay. All right. it's, it's, it's fine. Those, those types of questions, I will answer them. Don't worry. The type of questions that have to do with the slides and the lectures, don't worry. I will summarize it at the end. I want questions specifically to do with the content, what we're covering. Are there still any type of those questions or everyone is happy with the content? I'm right. sorry, sir. Mm -hmm. 
Um, how do you get the links of your Zoom, of your right, meeting? That's fine. I will talk about that. Okay, so all of the classes that I'm doing, I send the links to the groups, to the WhatsApp groups, right? So if you got the, what, the, the, the link to join from that WhatsApp group, that's where I'm going to send the video. You can also check my YouTube channel, Varsity Unlimited Tutors on YouTube. That's where these videos will also be uploaded. So you'll notice if you go to the channel, there'll be a lot of videos. Although what we do, because remember, we are a private tutorial company. Not all of our videos will be available the way that you would want them. Usually, we just make available maybe the first unit or the first two units on YouTube so that you can just see what we're trying to watch, what we're trying to do. So this example, this video, for example, it will be available for free on YouTube. So you can even just go to, you, to YouTube, Vaxity Unlimited Tutors, and you have access to it. Or you can check for the link in the WhatsApp group. I'll send the link usually uh, 30 minutes or so after the class. I'll send the link through to the WhatsApp group. Right. So, uh, like I said, for microeconomics, uh, in, in addition to the link, I'll also send the notes. Don't worry, I'll also send the notes to the word, to the group. Right. So, in addition to, to this module, we do a lot of different modules with the students. For the guys that are doing advanced diploma in business management, we do business finance, we do macroeconomics, we do management, we do understanding marketing, uh, we do... Uh, finance. I've sent through the timetable in the group. If you did not get the timetable, please uh, just check the group or you can WhatsApp me. I'll send you the, the, the timetable for the days that we do the classes. My WhatsApp number is the one that says gems at the bottom, uh, 071-3634, right? And then uh, for the guys that are doing first year, we officially are going to start the classes uh, next weekend for the guys that are doing first year, not ADBM, for the guys that are doing first year, that are doing economics, 1A, business, mathematics, informatics, those types of modules. We are going to start the classes next weekend. So I will post in your in your groups also the, the, the different uh, the different uh, looks at the different links and whatnot. Right. But uh, again, my name is James. I'm a private tutor. Right. So if you need extra help outside of the classes feel free to give me a call, feel free to send me a message and then you can see how we can help each other. Then if you also need to continue with these lessons, right? this week is going to be free. I think next week again will be free. But going forward, when you get to mid-September, because I will start doing the assignments, I cannot do the assignments on a public platform like this one, right? So it will only be for the students that are interested in paying for my what for my SIPs. So those are the students that I will do the assignments with, will do uh, exam preparation and whatnot with those students that are willing to pay for the service. It's 750 rand uh, per module. I think I posted the details before. I'll post them again, don't worry. It's just that for now it's for free, so I don't want to go too much into the into digging. But if you need to budget, budget about 750 rand. Right, pay each module that you're interested in joining. And this 750, like I said yesterday, it covers you for the lessons that we are doing, for the exam preparation that we will do, for the assignments and uh, the KCQs and whatnot, we'll do them together and we'll help you to make sure that you get your distinction at the, at the, at the end of the year, at the, end, at the end of the semester. So I think that that covers it. I don't know if there's anything that I did not say that you might want to know about. You said it's how much per per subject or module? It's seven hundred and fifty rand. It's seven hundred and fifty rand per module. The seven fifty covers you for the lessons from now up until uh is it what November when you do the exams, right? It also covers you for the assignments, it also covers you for the uh KCQ, the formative, the quiz that you're going to do, and it also covers you for exam preparation. So it means that essentially you know that you're not going to have any problems because we are essentially going to go through the whole process with you as the student. I'm not going to write the assignment for you, but essentially I'm giving you, you know, this is what you're supposed to write. Right? And then you go and you, you write. But I'm essentially making sure that everything that you need is available. If it needs to be referenced, I will show you where to get the references, how to do the referencing. Right? If you need paragraphs, I will tell you, you put your introduction there, you put your conclusion there, you put these things there. I will essentially guide you through the whole process that we're going to be, what? be doing at the end of the what? At the end of the day. All right. Anything else?
So the assumption is that um, after the free sessions, you will no longer post um, any videos and notes into the WhatsApp groups. Yes, yes, yes. So like I said, the free lessons, the ones that I'm doing for free right now, I will post them in the WhatsApp groups. But after I'm done with the free lessons, I will no longer be posting in the groups. So for now, you can enjoy. Even if you don't have your money, feel free to attend. Until I stop posting, then you know that it's done. Right. First of all, for those that are interested, you just uh, alert me, send me a WhatsApp message, and then we can what? We can uh, create a list of the students that we know that will be assisting for the semester. So we do this with every semester. Even if you check with the guys that are ahead of you, I think uh, that one was a bigger class because I think I had about 86 students that I was going through the whole semester with. Right, You guys, are, your, your class is a bit smaller because I checked in your webinar and about 140 of you. So I, I expect maybe 30 of you or so. But I don't know. We'll see how many of you are what are interested in the what in the in the classes. But at the end of the day, the the, the key value of what we are trying to do is we are just trying to make sure that you as the student you do not fail. But I know you guys have got bursaries. Some companies will tell you you pay us back our money if you fail. And again, if you fail, you have to re-register. So we're just trying to make sure that you do not fail. And I can essentially guarantee you, if you go through the classes that we do, if you want, you can send me a message or send you like videos of testimonials from students in the past semester or whatnot, right? If you go through the classes that we go through, you will not fail. Because we essentially just sit down with the students and say, okay, this is economy. Question number one, the lecturer was asking about this. We need to do it this way. Question number two, the lecturer was asking about this. And then we go through four or five past exam papers telling you what you needed to do. And most of these lecturers, they repeat questions. So when you get into the exam, you say, ah, this question we did with James, this question we did with James. I remember last semester, it was uh, introduction to business management. A week before the exam. The five questions that were in the exam, three of them, we did them like the last weekend when we were doing our exam preparation. So the students were very happy because they knew before they even started that that's 60% because we had done them within the preparation classes that we what that we're doing. So that's the value proposition of what we are offering. But it's a choice that you have to make as a student, right? You can also just choose the modules that you want. You don't have to choose everything. You can just choose maybe just one or two, the ones that you're struggling with. But I hope you join through. Uh, is there anything else before we dismiss each other for the day? Yes, uh, say I just want to find out about uh, the time of your classes. It's is seven it uh, every day? Every day. It's not every day, but it's seven o'clock. It's going to be every Sunday for microeconomics, every Thursday for business finance. I think uh, the other days should be Monday and Tuesday from advanced management principles and for marketing. I'll just have to confirm, but I believe it should be Monday and Tuesday for the other two modules, which means we won't have lectures on Fridays, we won't have lectures on Saturdays, we won't have lectures on Wednesday. So it's like uh, four days in a week at seven o'clock in the evening. Anything else? Uh, James? Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, quiet. Okay, okay. Uh, quiet. Like... Oh my God, okay. Okay, let's say Jacqueline. Jacqueline, can you go ahead? No. So I was asking regarding the 750, the one that mm -hmm. you said per module, it's 750. Yes. So with that 750, it covers for the whole semester or it's per month? No, it covers the whole semester for that specific module from now until November. Oh, mm -hmm. so then can I pay maybe in... Yeah, yeah installments, it's fine. I know you can do installments. You're allowed to do that. You can pay oh, you know, okay, no 250, 250, 250. That's still okay with me. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, sure. Thank you. All right. Uh, the other guy, I forgot the name. Uh, Mr. James, sorry. Yeah. Uh -huh. I just wanted to ask uh, is there by any chance we can get it maybe an access to maybe some of the past exam papers if, if possible? Yeah, it's possible. It's possible. What you can do, because I do with quite a lot of students, so sometimes I can forget some of these issues. You can send, send me a private message, James can, or even in the group, James, just a reminder, can you send us a past exam paper? I'll do that for you. Oh, okay. So it, uh, how many groups basically do you have, or is just any, any of your groups? Any of my groups. Any of my groups. Okay. Where you see yeah, I am okay. thank you. any of my groups. Yeah. Not a problem, Mr. James. Thank you so much. Okay, sure. Appreciate it. All right. Anything else?
Okay, if there's nothing else, guys, uh, please enjoy your evening. I will send the video through a little bit later uh, once it's loaded on, on my channel. Sure. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you very much, James. Bye bye. Thank, Thank you, James. Bye. 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 bye.